nf.io. All right, so I'm, I'm Steve Moore, and uh, this session is on suicide in jails. Um, I'll take the moderator's prerogative to say a few words first. Um, you know, in our country, there's always been a discussion of should we have rehabilitation or punishment for people in prisons? Um, moderating all that has been the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. I would say that nobody who's on that punishment side would think that we should be encouraging or allowing or in any way increasing the number of suicides for those that are caught up in the criminal justice system. Uh, so there's really a constitutional and a moral obligation when someone is incarcerated or gets caught up in the criminal justice system that they don't become more at risk for suicide. Um, so that's one of the things we're here to discuss today. Uh, you'll see the topic is suicide in jails, but that's a little narrow. Uh, what we're really going to be talking about is suicide for anybody caught up in the criminal justice system. From the time they're arrested and go to a police lockup, uh, when they go to a county jail for perhaps pretrial uh, incarceration because they can't make bond, uh, maybe a short sentence in a county jail or a city jail, and then into a state prison for longer sentences. And finally, parole, um, probation, and even beyond that. Uh, it was, you'll, definitely there's going to be some impacts of uh, in prison on a person's mental health. Uh, so those are the topics that we'll be discussing today. You've got everybody's bio, so I'm not going to bother reading them, and we're just going to jump right in. Uh, my first question will be to Michael Rosanoff. Uh, Michael, could you please describe uh, how the prevention of suicide for those in the criminal justice system has become a priority for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention? Uh, thanks, Steve, and my fellow panelists. Thank you all so much for being here, and good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Rosanoff. I'm the Senior Director for Project 2025 at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Project 2025 is our bold goal to reduce the rate of suicide 20% in the U.S. by the year 2025. I don't know if it was a few minutes later, maybe it was the day after, you know, hugging and kissing my wife and my family on New Year's Eve. Uh, I realized we're now in 2018, and 2025 is just that much closer. Uh, we, we had set out um, to achieve this in a 10-year vision, and uh, we're, we're now three years in. So we're on the clock, um, and the, the approach that we're taking to achieve this goal is um, taking what works, uh, evidence-based practices in suicide prevention, uh, and expanding the reach of them in the settings that are going to save the most lives in the shortest amount of time. This is a... a an effort that's really about dissemination and implementation in real time to make a real world difference in terms of lives saved. Uh, we've identified the settings where we can do this. By modeling it out, we've identified that large healthcare systems, including primary care settings, emergency departments, and the correction system, the criminal justice system, are key areas where individuals who are at risk for suicide often come into contact with and where you can implement suicide prevention strategies to have, uh, again, a real impact on lives saved. Now, although the, uh, the absolute numbers are not that large in the criminal justice system and in correction settings, uh, the rate of suicide is quite high in these settings. Um, we know that 35% of all deaths, the leading cause of death, is suicide in jails. And these numbers are the highest they've been ever. The numbers continue to go up. And uh, the, the, the trend seems similar for prisons as well. We have come to the appreciation that, uh, that the various touch points around the criminal justice and correction system, whether it's entry into the system or movement within the system or exiting out of the system, are critical windows of opportunity to implement suicide prevention strategies that can save lives. Um, I think the key here is that it's not just highly trained clinical care that can save lives. Uh, we do know that we can train uh, the community around individuals. We can train non-specialists to deliver suicide prevention strategies in non-specialized settings, in general community settings, uh, that can have a real impact on saving lives. And so our goal is to, uh, is, to, is to work within the system and around the system to make these system level changes. Uh, we call it a, a top-down meets bottom-up approach. From the top-down standpoint, we're working with groups like the National Commission on Correctional Health Care. Joe will speak a little bit more about their efforts, um, where the objective is to set the standards of care for uh, behavioral, uh, behavioral care, mental health care, and the coordination of that with, uh, with uh, general health care within the correction setting. 
Uh, and by developing these standards of care, these uh, guidelines, or even policies, we can have an impact on how healthcare is delivered within these systems in a coordinated fashion from that top down. But from the bottom up, we're working through our vast network of uh, AFSP chapters. We have chapters in every state around this country to work from a grassroots level, to work from the community level. By working within jails, um, within local jails, for example, um, but also within courts, um, within uh, police departments, the idea is that we can educate the community uh, to make a, a change in culture, a, a more compassionate community around uh, what their role is in preventing suicide. We can provide information and basic training for example, correction officers to understand what the warning signs, the risk factors are for suicide uh, and equip them uh, with the skills that will empower them to then play a, a strategic role in suicide prevention. And we want to do this in a very systematic way. So with Project 2025, we do believe we can save at least 1,000 lives by the time 2025 rolls around. Um, we think because the correction system is a boundaried system that we have a lot to learn by uh, seeing what is possible within the system. We do think we can, we can prevent all suicide uh, within the correction system because of its sort of controlled nature. Um, we can glean from that and bring that into the health systems and emergency departments, the other areas of Project 2025. So for us, the key is, uh, is learning from the community. We know suicide prevention, but we don't necessarily know the correction system. Um, and so we're honored to be part of this panel um, and to work with folks like Karen and Joe uh, to really develop a, a strategy around how we can stop suicide in correction settings. All right, my next question is directed to uh, Dr. Karen Abram. Uh, Dr. Abram, or Karen, um, what are the special challenges that uh, juveniles face when they're caught up in the criminal justice system? Um, so, for I'm Karen Abram, just so you know, um, in, for the last 20 years we've been conducting the Northwestern Juvenile Project, which is a longitudinal study of the mental health needs and outcomes of juveniles in detention in this case. And um, for we randomly sampled 2,000, almost 1,800 youth, and at intake to detention, we assess their mental health needs. And for the past um, 20 years, we've been relocating them and re-interviewing them wherever they're living in the community or in correctional settings to better understand their mental health needs and how they sort of fare through the system. Um, so, you know, in detention, um, the their needs are profound. Um, the two-thirds of the females and three-quarters of the males had a uh, psychiatric disorder. Um, they were more likely to have two disorders than one disorder. The prevalence of trauma um, was, you know, as you might expect, was still shocking. And an average of six different traumas, um, separate traumas that each of them endorsed, um, profound histories of sexual and physical abuse. Over time, you know, and, and another point I want to make is that in detention, at least in the city of Chicago, um, in this area, you know, the, the minority youth actually looked a little better in some ways than the um, non-Hispanic whites, and the females looked a little worse than the males in detention. And part of that's probably who gets into the criminal justice system. It's a lot harder to get a for a girl to end up to be detained. A lot of a lot of different efforts are made to divert females and also I think whites who have more resources and often family resources to help them be diverted from the system. So 12 to 15 years later, you know, what's going on with this population? First of all, 7% um, of our sample has died um, and almost all from violent gunshot death. Although 7% uh, of those died by suicide um, and another 9% from overdoses. So they're at risk right from the start to, for their lives. Um, the recidivism rates are also profound. It was 94% of males, 75% of females were reincarcerated. We're not just talking rearrested, we're talking reincarcerated, at least in jail or detention, um, since the time we met them. And that was, for half of them, that was not their first detention. Twelve years later, only half of these youth had finished high school or had a GED. Those rates are even lower than in the city of Chicago. This is a very at-risk population for them. By the median age of 28 years, 91% of the males 
and 78% of females had met criteria for a substance use disorder at least once in their life. Now we're not just talking substance use at this point, we're talking disorders where they acknowledge that their use is impairing their ability to function and, um, and uh, to progress in the relationships. Fifteen years after detention, still half of the males and a third of the females still met criteria for a psychiatric disorder. Uh, again, we're not talking symptoms here, we're talking full-blown, diagnosable conditions that are not only symptomatic but also impairing their ability to function. Now, of course, externalizing disorders or disorders characterized by problem behaviors was the most prevalent, but even if you remove those, there's still 30% um, of the males and 23% of the females still need criteria for disorder. So externalizing disorders were the most prevalent, followed by mood disorders and substance use disorders. So these disorders extend well past adolescence. Employment, only 20% of males and 39% of females were working full time. Um, only 40% of females and uh, males and two thirds of females had any kind of residential independence where they had their own their own place with a partner or on their own. And only a quarter of males and 84% of females were parenting their own children. And finally, a, a finding I want to highlight is that the social support networks of these youth are extremely small and extremely dense. And what that means is they don't have a lot of people in their lives, and this is, we assess this on the brink of adulthood, people in their lives who were not female family members who all knew each other. And when you think about the young people in your lives and what it takes to launch into adulthood, you know, you need connections, you need people who recognize other aspects of your strengths and weaknesses and can provide opportunities. So, um, I, should, I will just mention that what predicts their outcomes as being good are better verbal abilities and having started on their delinquency or their substance use later in life. So what does this mean? What it means is that we have to focus on early identification. There's no substitute for that. We need integrated and sustained mental health care and um, vocational support and opportunities and mentoring and social support. You need the whole package for them. All right, my next question is to uh, Dr. Joseph Penn. Uh, so Joe, um, with your work through, with the prisons, corrections facilities, are jails and prisons aware of the issue of suicide among their prisoners and what are they doing about it? I would say absolutely and good morning everyone. Thank you for having me and uh, this is an honor and thank you to my fellow panelists. I would say absolutely, unequivocally, jails and prisons and everything, be it ICE facilities, be it uh, county, state, or federal, are aware because there's much more litigation. Uh, for the folks that aren't aware, there have been a lot of landmark cases. Estelle V. Gamble, as uh, our moderator alluded to earlier, really established there was a constitutional right to afford health care for serious medical and mental health needs. And so, frankly, if you're not providing suicide prevention and there's a bad outcome, you're going to get sued either in state court or federal court. And the individuals who will get sued would be all the jailers, the sheriff, the wardens, the superintendents, regardless of, you know, if you're talking juvenile, adult, state or federal, and the healthcare entity, whether it be private, for profit, the university, whoever does it, they're going to get sued in state or federal court, typically under 1983 civil rights violations or alternatively medical malpractice, deliberate indifference claims. Uh, recently, there's been more litigation with Americans with Disabilities Act that you didn't afford uh, somebody who had a mental, uh, identified mental health condition, you didn't afford them or make a reasonable accommodation, so, or all the above. Uh, so absolutely, I would say wardens, money folks, policymakers are, are realizing this is a significant issue. And it's not even just the issue of litigation and being sued or in state or federal court or being put under a monitor or receivership. But it's one, it's really the right thing to do. Uh, I don't know how many custody folks we have in here, but it really takes a special person to work behind bars, to go in day in, day out, put yourself behind bars. And the population that we have is a very heterogeneous population. We have individuals in there that are very dangerous, aggressive, assaultive, violent, 
security threat groups, gangs, you, you name it. And then we have vulnerable kids that have been waved up to the adult system. We have females, pregnant moms, geriatric, dementia. I mean, we have the full gamut, sex offenders, we have everything. So, uh, and then oh, and lo and behold, we have more and more mentally ill behind bars, folks with mental health issues. So I think custody, we really have traction or buy-in where they, one, they want to do the right thing. They don't want to have a suicide on their watch. Two, <laughs> The mandate is coming from their higher-ups, their superintendents, their directors are saying, we don't want any more suicides. And frankly, and we've talked earlier today about the effects that it has on the family uh, of, you know, when a, someone commits suicide or alternatively commits suicide is unsuccessful and there's sequelae from it. But what about the bystanders that respond, the, the, uh, the first responders that have to cut somebody down who's hanging? the impact it has on nursing staff who are doing CPR or correctional staff that are doing CPR or trying to get rescue and do intervention, call 911 and get the person out. So it really has a significant and profound effect on everyone. And at the end of the day, it's litigation really drives the ship. So I would say absolutely systems, and it's a partnership. What I'm seeing nationally, healthcare and custody are working together and working together to try to address this public health issue. All right. Um, this is really a question for any of you or all of you. Uh, looking at jails, prisons, and sort of post-release, are the causes of suicides different for each of those? Do you see any uh, differentiation in that? I did, Karen. I did want to make uh, mention that um, the 20 years ago, our rates of suicide and corrections was actually you know, two to three times higher than it is now. But we do seem to have plateaued. Um, over the last maybe eight to ten years, in particular, and one of the one of the, why was it working before? You know, there was an increased focus originally on intake screening, and um, once an inmate was identified as at risk, you know, making sure they were in a protected sort of suicide safe room in corrections, and, and they've made a lot of progress with this throughout correctional systems. It's much more likely to have every in inmate screened. But they tend to identify inmates who are already identified. Either the inmate's willing to tell you they've c tried to commit suicide before, but uh, you know, if they're most likely to identify people for mental health services in correctional settings if they have a history of mental health services. So what needs to happen now in all levels of the system from arrest all the way up to prison is um, to train to increase, build on what we have, and to begin to train staff to identify signs for suicide uh, risk um, for previously unidentified populations. You know, recent suicides in corrections now are characterized much more by, uh, more often by clean cases. These are people who've never been identified from the system before, um, who are not necessarily um, in isolation anymore, who are, um, uh, um, and whereas before and who are not intoxicated and who aren't committing suicide within the first 24 hours. That used to be very common. It's not as common anymore. 25% of cases in the first 24 hours, but the next 25% are within the next two weeks. So there has to be an increase in focus on, on training staff at all levels to understand um, that they're responsible for identifying mental health needs as they emerge. I'm so glad you brought that point up, the difference between jails and prisons. When people in a jail could be there for a few days, a few hours, or a few weeks, they're coming in either under the influence of drugs or they're withdrawing. They're going through psychological withdrawal. Uh, then the issue of they, they're thinking, am I going to catch a long time? Am I going to get you know, my probation revoked? Am I going to get 10, 15, 20 years? Then they come to prison. So. Really, a lot of it, as you brought up, is depression and anxiety and drug and alcohol. But then there's also the issue of situational factors where they're worried about, am I going to see my loved one? Uh, why isn't anybody calling or writing or coming in to visit me or putting money on my books, on my commissary? Um, getting a Dear John letter. We see that where somebody gets a letter saying, I'm never going to, I'm going to divorce you. I'm never going to come see you again. So it can be a situational stressor. Uh, we call them adjustment disorder when somebody maybe have conflict with their cellmate, they might have um, 
gambling debts, they might run up debts with football season going on or, or things like that. So it can be a lot of situational variables. Somebody who's very small might feel very vulnerable compared to a big, you know, muscular, tatted up person. So there's a lot of different situational variables. What about, uh, yes, Michael, Steve, I can ahead. just add, I mean, I think it's been stated here, but it's worth restating um, in terms of risk factors. Um, it's certainly clear that there's a relationship between the likelihood of being incarcerated and that of having a mental health condition, and then, of course, um, an increased risk for suicide, um, perhaps because of a common pathway there. I think the key is um, what, what um, Karen and Joe have mentioned, is focusing on those transition periods, right? The, the period of entry into the system or movement within the system or even exiting out of the system. I think we have a real appreciation for uh, those being these critical periods of, um, of opportunity for intervention. And there are these critical time interventions that are out there um, that have been used, you know, um, even in the correction system, but maybe not focusing on suicide specifically. I know they focused on job placement and homelessness and things like that. Um, so for us, you know, the opportunity and, and things that we want to learn are, are what is working elsewhere around these transition periods in terms of improving overall health. It doesn't even have to necessarily be mental health, uh, but that we can glean from and, and translate into mental health care that ultimately reduces the, the rate of suicide. Well, do we have good data showing causes that for the various transition periods or, you know, there's very Karen? good. There's good data on what predicts suicide, what predicts suicidal ideation and behavior. There's almost no data on what works in terms of prevention and corrections. Only this year, last year, NIMH finally has made it a priority to fund studies looking at interventions in jail settings. That's a, a new initiative on their part. But really, we, I could find nothing out there on what's successful. Now, there's a lot of great experts, and there's a lot of very important, we know what needs to be done, but there's not data on what works. And, you know, uh, historically, academics come in with their intervention, and they, they do the study in a setting, and it works really well, and then they leave, and then it's over, and then the gains reduce, and things go back to how they were. And I think it's important at this point to be doing some of the things that you're talking about, which is to partner with the correctional systems um, to work together to develop an intervention and to make sure that the intervention is acceptable to the staff, is appropriate to the setting, is um, that people can actually be um, accurate in how they're delivering the intervention, that it's cost effective, and, and most important, that it can be sustained after this initial push is over. And that's what implementation science is, is trying to um, accomplish. Do we have, sorry, if I could piggyback yeah, on that. Yeah. I, I definitely agree, academia needs to get more involved. We need more public health, epidemiology. We need AFSP. We need leadership in this area because a lot of correctional systems are kind of wary of research. They kind of view that you're gonna come in there and do your little guinea pig research and then you're gonna take the results and go do your stuff and publish it and then it could be used against you, against your system in court. So there's a little bit of wariness and suspiciousness about that. And then there, obviously there's the issue of it's a vulnerable population and doing research with a vulnerable population. But I, I did want to add that anytime there's this, uh, a, a completed suicide or a near miss, it's really important under the NCCHC standards, the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare Standards, to do a review. So we call it a cri critical incident review or a psychological autopsy. There's a lot of different terms for it. But it, where you have custody and healthcare staff looking at what happened, what went wrong, what could have been done better, not necessarily you're fired, but more a what are the processes or steps that broke down. Usually it's a multifactorial thing. It's not just one person goofed up. Uh, so that's a really important issue is there needs to be some review administratively, psychologically, to figure out what was going on with this person before and during and while they actually attempted. And that's some of the most challenging things I think that we, 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 we deal with. Michael, is uh, AFSP part of their, a lot of the money with AFSP goes to research. Are they planning to dedicate any of that research toward the Project 2025 areas and specifically some of the things Karen and uh, Joe were talking about? Uh, yes, so I mean historically AFSP has been a research funding organization and still one of the biggest private funders of suicide prevention research. Uh, and Project 2025 and the areas around it including suicide and corrections is, uh, is an area of, of importance. However, 
Project 2025 is actually not one about research today. It's about yesterday's research and taking what we've learned from that research and actually applying it in real world settings. Um, the challenge is research takes time, there's many hoops to jump through, and then publishing that research takes time, and then does anyone actually read the publication or does it sit on the shelf? Um, you know, these are the challenges around the, the thinking of this in, in just the context of research. While important and it needs to be done, from AFSP standpoint or in Project 2025, we want to figure out what's already working. Um, even if it's not a, a direct you know, example or model, the idea is we could adapt it. We could adapt it for use in these settings by partnering with folks who know these settings and make it something useful today. So that's what we're trying to do. It's really operationalizing um, what we know needs to be done um, uh, in a way that would work, it's feasible, it's cost effective, it's sustainable for those systems themselves. Um, so the key there is it's a little bit of a shift in thinking, uh, even on the part of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, instead of just raising resources for large-scale research projects, the idea is to give back to those communities that have helped raise the research funding uh, and develop uh, programs that the communities themselves can implement. One of the things I read recently from the Department of Justice is there are 2,800 different uh, prison jurisdictions in this country, states, local, you know, county, city. How do we get the word out to 2,800 different jurisdictions? This is the kind of thing you should be doing. Are there any national standards? Joe, you mentioned there some. There are several. So I think most folks here are familiar with the Joint Commission on Correctional Health Care, Joint Commission. If you, you know, go to a hospital or go to a daycare or surgery, uh, they're typically accredited by the Joint Commission. There's two other, well, there's three. The Amer American Correctional Association is an organization that accredits jails and prisons across the country, and I think now internationally. And then there's NCCHC, National Commission on Correctional Health Care. What I've seen is a pattern of a lot of individuals, it's a voluntary accreditation, so you don't have to do it, but it's a really good thing to do because if you kind of follow the policies and standards, it'll really, it's like a risk management 101 of avoiding lawsuits and litigation. And what I've seen, some judges actually will order a facility or a system, they'll say, you must be AC accredited or you must be NCCHC accredited. Um, there's another one, the CALEA, which is more sh uh, sheriffs and counties do that sort of thing, law enforcement agencies. But I, I would say having national evidence-based standards that are pulled together by multidisciplinary organizations and revised every three to four years about suicide best practices I'll just give, give you a good example. So NCCHC used to have a standard of you know, close observation, constant observation, five minute, 15 minute. Some people read it very much to the letter of the law of you will do a five minute check every five minutes. And now we've changed the standard where it's an irregular or unpredictable or staggered. So that's a good example of something that we really try to keep pace with the field to give guidance and really, again, custody working in collaboration with, with healthcare staff. Uh, Michael, one of the things that uh, Project 2025 plans to do, I know, is to use the local chapters to get involved. You know, how do you see them being able to do sort of a ground-up change to the criminal justice system? Yeah, that, that's a great question. <laughs> We're, uh, that's something we want to figure out. Again, you know, uh, from, uh, from our standpoint, we, we have boots on the ground. And as an organization, we know how to prevent suicide. But we don't know how to work with the correction system. Uh, so we need to figure out a mechanism to have those types of conversations. Do we knock on the door of the local jail? I mean, that's actually worked out in our, our uh, Oregon chapter. We ac actually held a walk, a suicide prevention walk within a jail. But that was completely organized from within the jail. They wanted to do that because they, uh, it, uh, it was a prison, sorry, uh, because they, it was an issue for them. Um, it, it hit home, they had a recent suicide and they wanted to do something um, for the inmates, for the staff, for everyone in that community. And so they turned to us through a relationship that we had for help. Is that a model? Is that going to help change practice within the, the, the prison? We're not, we're not sure. Um, but we know we have to have the conversations. And so we're open to ideas of how AFS, AFSP can support suicide prevention activity within uh, the, and around the correction system, including courts and working with you know, corrections officers and even police departments. Um, we're taking ideas. And I have one final question. We need to get the sure. questions from the audience. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that I think AFSP is pretty clear on from every research we've ever seen is 90% of people that die by suicide had either a mental health condition or substance use disorder. Do prisons just attract more people with substance use disorder and mental health conditions, or 
Does it create them? Well, you know, we, we did a study many years ago looking at police decision making with mentally ill citizens. And one of the things we found was that the police were definitely more likely to arrest people with mental illness than people without for doing the same thing. But it was not because they were out to get them. It was because so many of these folks have both a mental disorder and a substance use disorder. And if the police took them to a detox center, they didn't want them because they were nuts. And if you took them to a mental health center, they didn't want them because it disrupted their milieu because they were addicts. The jail has a no decline policy and for many, many, many years um, has become, in fact, in Cook County as the largest mental health center in the country at the jail. Um, so part of it is what when we, you know, it's sort of a um, fallout from deinstitutionalization and we still haven't figured out how to take care of our mentally ill and substance abusing citizens. Joe, what do you think? Is, does prison create perhaps some mental health conditions? Well, I would say we definitely, there's an overrepresentation of both mental health and substance use disorders, but if any one of us got incarcerated, it's a whole different world. There's rules, there's hierarchies, there's structure. If you're a sex offender, you're bottom man of the totem pole. If you're a child sex offender, you're even lower. You know, so there's different hierarchies within prison. There's rules and things you do and don't do for your personal safety. So. I think there's a lot of issues in addition to depression and untreated mental health issues, psychosis and, and other illnesses, bipolar, that people can have situational stressors and they just view suicide as that's, that's the end all. And we've seen a lot of people as they're about to leave custody also and they don't really know where they're going to be living or who they're going to be living with. And we have you know, serious suicide attempts, the same sort of thing, as they're on the door on the way out leaving the facility. So, so those are serious issues also, absolutely. Right. Um, all right, we were supposed to have online questioning, and I don't see anybody that's made an online question, so we'll just take them from the audience. Go ahead. Certainly. Yeah, let me ask, answer, respect the question first, so because I it may not come out on the uh, video. So the question is, uh, when someone is announced to be on a suicide watch, what does it mean? What's the process? Uh, and, and Jill, go ahead and answer. Right. So typically, what happens when somebody comes into a correctional facility? They're typically seen by a nurse or some sort of healthcare professional, and they go through a screening process, and they're asked a lot of questions. Do you have any history of mental health issues? Have you ever attempted suicide? Are you on any psychiatric medications? Those sort of health issues, allergies. Just like if you went to the doctor's office, same sort of thing. If the person is endorsing current suicide risk, and, and there's a lot of really good questionnaires, there's different things that can be done in a time-effective manner. If somebody screens positive, if you will, they can be placed on a suicide watch until they can be referred to mental health and this is the biggest challenge, and we saw this in, we see this in smaller facilities where what if you only have a social worker that comes to the facility once a week or a qualified mental health professional, you know, two days a week. So the idea of the suicide watch is not meant to be punitive, and I think a lot of people, it's like a one and done thing. Oh, you're suicidal. Oh, well, here's your suicide smock. We're, take everything away from you and strip you naked, and that people figure out really quickly of, I don't want to say I'm suicidal because that's not a, a good way to be. So. <laughs> they take everything away. So it's really a, like a layered defense, to use a sports analogy. At any time during somebody's incarceration, they can become suicidal. And so a suicide watch is a clinically based decision where we recommend to custody staff of this is how you can keep this person safe. And so it's a clinically determined by medical or mental health or nursing staff. And ideally, the mental health staff will then provide counseling and treatment in addition to just saying you need to be on a suicide watch. So I hope that answers your question. Go ahead. Uh, many years ago, I worked in mental health, and that was before the federal government determined that we would basically close the doors to many of our mental health institutions and put people out in the community. We were drugging them, and they were sneaking away their lives, and Congressman got onto that and decided that was not the way to go. So we had. Reasons for there to be a lot of mentally ill people arrested, 
If I can restate it real quickly, about 25 years ago we closed many of our mental health institutions and done nothing since. And we now have people in the streets or people getting arrested. Um, panel? You know, I think one of the most interesting aspects of that question is that we're now starting to empty out our prisons. Um, it's, it's happening. It needs to happen. We're over-incarcerating compared to, you know, any other, any other uh, civilized country in the, in the, um, in the world. And uh, what kinds of plans are we making for our citizens who have mental health needs? I think that the, I once saw a chart that showed as the census of mental health centers, the hospitals go down, the prison census goes up, and that's been shown over history. Um, and uh, so I think that's going to be one of the intriguing questions is what we are going to do to help this population. I can add, I think, you know, one of the challenges is whether it be behind bars or outside, you know, in, in, in the outside world. It's a capacity issue. It's uh, having the capacity to provide services, even if we know it works. Um, we don't necessarily have enough trained uh, people to deliver those services. Um, this is what makes this a public health issue. It's not just a, a clinical issue that has to happen or, or be treated within clinical settings, although uh, for those who need it, ultimately that's where we want to get these, these individuals. But um, you know, there is, I think there is we do need to change our thinking around suicide prevention and thinking about it as a real public health issue um, and developing strategies that will essentially increase the capacity to deliver services and it's probably training uh, less specialized uh, service professionals to deliver that type of care. Uh, I think it's empowering the community to realize they do have a role to play in suicide prevention. I know I've, I've said that before but it's, again it's worth repeating. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what AFSP is trying to do, is identify that opportunity and, and make that a reality, empower communities. Um, but I think that's, that's the answer. It's a capacity issue. There's no way we're going to have enough highly trained service professionals to deliver mental health care to all those individuals who need it. Uh, so we need to figure out a new, a new way of, uh, of thinking about it, and that's from a public health standpoint. If I could add, one of the biggest challenges is when people come behind bars, it's almost like there's comorbidity. So it's not just somebody that has chronic schizophrenia, they also have hepatitis B and C or HIV or they have cardiac disease. So we see a lot of comorbidities. They haven't really accessed health care in the free world. And so th they get this like disease burden, they come to us and now infectious disease, tuberculosis, uh, mer you know, staph infections, we have to treat it all. So we see a lot of comorbidity <laughs> behind bars. And I think it's a great training site for students and trainees because we're treating the folks who were in the state hospitals 10, 15, 20 years ago. We're treating really sick folks that, that have come our way now. And so we, we, by default, we have to step up and, and do the best we can. All right, I'm really sorry, but uh, this could probably go a few more hours. Uh, but we now have to, I don't want to stand between you and lunch. And uh, our time is now over. So uh, thank you for coming to this session. And we'll be around on some talk to us.